The Giants lost a ton of ground in the standings coming out of the All-Star break. What did they lose? Seven in a row coming out of the break. And it was obvious they needed to get hot and they needed to get hot in a hurry. And to their credit, so far, they've done it. So we're going to get into what they've been doing successfully and what they need to continue to do next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. And on today's show, we're going to get into the Giants' win last night against the Arizona Diamondbacks, a team they had been 3-6 and six against this season after dominating, dominating them last year. I think they were, what, 17-2 and two or something crazy against Arizona last year. So going 3-6, and six, it's hard to say it's a big reason why the Giants are in the less-than-ideal position they're in, but if you can go instead like 8-1, and one, it makes a big difference. So winning that game last night... Was a big deal. Madison Bumgarner on the mound for the D-backs. He has been tough on the Giants, but he's generally not the same guy. And so they were able to take advantage of having him on the mound. And they put up six runs on him. And they were able to win the game, I want to say, somewhat rather easily. They had some tense moments, but a nice 6-1 to one win. Alex Cobb just continues to be really good. He The peripherals early on suggested that he was getting extremely unlucky. We're going to look back now pretty early on in the season. He had this crazy high ERA, but good peripherals. And then since that early point, we will see that he's actually been very good. So we'll get into those numbers a bit later. But I just want to update you on the state of this race. The Giants are 58 and 57. So back over 500 for the first time since, what, the day before the trade deadline. So it had been a couple weeks. They had fallen what, three games under 500, maybe four at one point. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's we're not going to, again, plan the World Series parade based on being one game over 500, but Giants have won four in a row. They are 7-2 and two in their last nine games, starting with that little two-game sweep in Oakland. So you might be thinking, these are bad teams. The Giants should be winning. You're absolutely right, and that is why they need to be winning, because it is no guarantee, as we as we saw for the first many months of the season, that when a bad team comes into town that you're going to take advantage. And also, let's be clear, the Diamondbacks are not what I would call a bad team. And like I said, they've been tough on the Giants this year. They've got some real young talent, and it's kind of a tough matchup in a lot of ways because they're the anti-Giants. They're like fast and athletic and good defensively, and that has showed up in a big way in a lot of these games against Arizona. They've got another top prospect. ESPN just called him the top prospect in baseball, Corbin Carroll, in AAA, ready to come up. So the D-backs are going to be a force to be reckoned with here. And so, yeah, I mean, you can't take these games for granted and that they're automatically wins. You have to go out there and earn it. And this is a four-game series, and you've got Merrill Kelly tonight. And so you had to, Merrill Kelly being good and has been really, really tough on the Giants. And so if you lost yesterday then you like absolutely have to win this game with Merrill Kelly on the mound. It's tough, but now you're riding high four games in a row, and maybe they can finally get to Kelly. So they're 22 and a half games back in the West. Let's let's just, the less said about that, the better. But only five and a half games back in the wildcard standings. They did pick up half a game yesterday because the Padres lost and fell to the third wildcard spot which entering yesterday belonged to the Phillies. So the Giants didn't gain any ground on the Phillies, but the Phillies gained ground on the Padres. The Padres fell, and now the Giants gained a half game. So it Philadelphia and San Diego have kind of been flip-flopping between that second and third wildcard team. So it depends on who's third 
in terms of how much ground can you gain if you win a game and how much ground do you lose if you lose a game. So because there's no clear team that's that third team, we're going to have to keep updating this every day, basically. I do just want to point out as well, the Giants have a plus 24 run differential, which now has an expected win-loss record of 60 and 55. And so for the longest time, they've been underperforming this run their run differential by two or three wins and now it's up to five with a with a hefty win yesterday six to one and so does this really matter actually what am i saying they're underperforming it by two i'm i'm sorry they're underperforming and performing it by two wins so i mean 60 and 55 would look a lot better than 58 and 57 but that's just the reality of you're not always going to perform exactly how your run differential predicts so at five and a half games back, Fangraphs lists the Giants' playoff odds at six and a half percent. It's crazy. The whole rest of the National League is pretty settled. There's one of these teams that has a high probability for sure that won't make it, but you've got the the Mets and Braves like all but guaranteed to get in. The Phillies at eighty percent, the Cardinals at eighty percent, the Brewers at fifty four percent, and the Padres at eighty percent. One of those teams, all of whom have above fifty percent odds, at least one of them will not make it and then you've got the Giants at six and a half percent and everybody else at zero rounded to one decimal point I didn't mention the Dodgers they're also at a hundred percent so yeah I mean the Giants are still in we've got 47 games to play so five and a half games back once you get around five or even when you get less than five to me you're very much still in the race if you've got a couple of months or a month and a half left to play and so they just need to continue to play well the schedule is going to continue to be relatively soft they've got these three more games in Arizona or at excuse me against Arizona in San Francisco then they go to Colorado for three off day at Detroit for two both of the all D-backs Rockies and Tigers all below 500 another off day and then at Minnesota and then back home to play the Padres, and the Phillies. So you've got the weak schedule. The Twins aren't playing well either. And then you come home and play the two teams that are the second and third wildcard team. So the Giants have their opportunity. That's kind of the big takeaway here is at the very least, they have an opportunity here in the next couple of weeks. And then the schedule really does have some tough pockets. They've got the Dodgers for three, a double header against the Brewers. Then... They go to Chicago, but then they play the Braves and Dodgers in a homestand, and then they go to Colorado and Arizona. So that's actually, it gets softer again. And then they come home to play Colorado and Arizona. And the season was supposed to end then, but because of the lockout, the first series of the year got moved to the last series of the year, and so they go to San Diego. So another chance, potentially. Like, if you're two games back of the Padres for the final wildcard spot and you end with three in San Diego, you've got a shot. And so that's all you can really ask for. I mean, obviously, we'd all want 107 wins and winning the division every year. But to me, you might as well try to be in like try to enjoy this. Right. Try to just have belief and hope, because what else is a baseball season really for? And so to me, it's great that they didn't crumble and they're still in contention. And I hope they can just keep it going as long as possible. So coming up in just a minute, I want to get into Alex Cobb and the starting rotation as a whole. Alex Cobb wasn't necessarily at his best last night. He had shaky command and kind of grinded through the whole outing. But overall, he's just been a very solid pitcher for the Giants. And their rotation has been arguably, maybe even, the best in the game. We'll get into why in just a second. But first, if you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, you're depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor Ready? Delicious indulgent cookie dough. My personal favorite. Covered in chocolate. That's right. Built has done it again. Let me introduce you to your new favorite. At least it's mine. Cookie dough chunk puffs have a light and chewy texture. Real cookie dough chunks. And of course, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. All the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it. Plus, super importantly to me, it's healthy for you. Cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories and they have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. You're going to love the new cookie dough chunk puff, whether you need a snack for a workout 
a late night treat, or just to grab a quick bite. Built is the perfect protein bar. They taste better than a candy bar. So ditch the calories, ditch the fat, ditch the sugar, and grab yourself a Built bar. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKEDON15, one word, and get 15% off your order. Use promo LOCKEDON15. All right, as promised, we are going to talk about the starting rotation, which has quietly, it's really been quiet because there's been so many other issues with the Giants. And really not so many other issues. The offense has been fine. The starting pitching has been good and unlucky at times and unlucky in part due to just having a flopping defense behind them, which is not their fault, right? So in some ways they're unlucky, but it you can't re- really necessarily say the team has been unlucky with the defensive issues, but the defense and the bullpen have been problems, but the hitting has been okay. The starting pitching has been really good. And so Alex Cobb is no exception. And I just thought it was interesting to look back. I don't know exactly the point when it was like peak unluckiness for Alex Cobb, but I kind of pinpointed in on around May 23rd when Alex Cobb had only thrown 31 and two-thirds innings, but he had a 6.25 ERA. And so that was terrible. I think it was worst, or among the certainly among the very worst in the game. But as we were screaming about at the time, he had a, a 2.74 fielding independent pitching, FIP, 2.39 expected fielding independent pitching, which is just like normalizing your home run to fly ball ratio, setting it to the league average. It's all kind of, it's not really complicated, but it's, I'm not sure anyone really cares. Basically, these are when people say peripherals. It's like the things you can control, how well are you at doing them? And then it's like making a number that's suggesting what your ERA ought to be when you just take out random results, basically, that can be influenced by things like bad defense. And so... Let's just look at this for a second. Again, 6.25 ERA. This is through seven starts and a 2.74 fielding independent pitching. Think about the name, right? Fielding independent pitching. So since that point in time, Alex Cobb has made 12 more starts and his ERA over those last 12 starts is 2.93. 2.93 over his last 12 And so what was more predictive, the 6.25 ERA or the 2.74 fielding independent pitching? As we can see, the ERA over the last 12 very closely ended up aligning with what that fielding independent pitching was, suggesting he had earned or deserved over the first seven starts. And so that's when we say like, these numbers tend to be more predictive of future performance, of future ERA even, than actual ERA. That's a perfect illustration of it. So, yeah, I mean, overall, he still hasn't come all the way back. He still has a 3.99 ERA, which is, when adjusted for park effect, it is roughly league average. But the fielding independent pitching is still almost a run better at 3.04. And so that continues to be in my opinion, more indicative of what he's deserved and possibly even what to expect moving forward is about an ERA of three, which is excellent. And so if you're getting this from a guy who is towards the back of your rotation, is he? I think he's pitching fourth in the rotation right now behind Rodon and Webb and Wood. And then you've got Junis and Wood has been quite good recently, quite good. And then, of course, Webb and Rodon have basically been doing it all season long. So not only is that a good thing for the rest of the season, but I do just want to point out as well, as I've said numerous times on the show, that the Giants, like they went into last offseason with only Logan Webb as a starting pitcher under contract for 2022. And so they had to rebuild their rotation on the the fly. They re-signed Alex Wood and Anthony DiSclefani. They brought in Carlos Rodon and they brought in uh, Alex Cobb and also guys like Jacob Junis, Matthew Boyd and other depth pieces. And Junis has been the one to emerge out of that depth to kind of grab a hold of a spot. But going into this offseason, only Carlos Rodon is an impending free agent. And 
I have made this point. So Logan Webb is under club control for four seasons, counting this one. Four, so three more seasons after 2022. Alex Cobb, speaking of him, Giants have him signed for $9 million for next year, and there's a club option for $10 million for 2024. So they, to me, like this is looking like a good deal. And it was right away, even though the ERA was high. Those peripherals were exciting, and he's lived up to it more recently. I just want to mention before I forget, he's throwing nine, he threw 97.1 miles an hour, the fastest pitch of his career yesterday. Going into yesterday's outing, the 176, I think, fastest pitches of his career have all come this season. And it's not like he's 28 years old. Alex Cobb is uh, 34. He's going to turn 35 in October. And so he went to driveline and, you know, where they work on mechanics and he was able to add velocity here. This is a guy who used to average on his fastball 90, 91 miles an hour. And now that's the average velocity of his splitter. And he's throwing his fastball an average of about 95. And so it's just impressive how later in his career he's added velocity. He's been relatively healthy this year. He already has surpassed his 2021 innings total. And I mean, he's been banged up a couple times, but for the most part, he's been out there. So anyway, that's good to see. And then Alex Wood is under contract for next year and then re reaches free agency after that. And Anthony DiScalfani, this is the one that kind of looks perhaps like a mistake, but it seems to have a ton to do with this ankle injury. But he is signed for two additional seasons after 2022. But the point is, They've got a bunch of money coming off the books, but their starting rotation is mostly set. Whether it's bringing back Rodon or signing just maybe one other big name starter, which they've been able to do with Gosman and Rodon, uh, they basically are almost set as a starting rotation. I do think they need to make add a significant arm like a Carlos Rodon or somebody else of that caliber, but then you're done and you can focus on more of the position player and bullpen side. And so that's a big difference between this year and last year. So I just, I think that puts them in a pretty good position when you look at the big name free agents that are out there, Trey Turner, Aaron Judge, Carlos Correa potentially, and uh, Brandon Nimmo and on and on. They are in a better position because they don't have to focus so much on the starting rotation. So I just wanted to mention how the Giants stack up. I said perhaps, arguably, they have the best starting rotation. That would be by looking at fielding independent pitching as opposed to ERA. If you look at ERA, they're not, I mean, they're kind of close to the top, but they're not at the top. But if you look at fielding independent pitching by their starting rotation, the Giants are first in a landslide. They're at 3.15. The next closest team is the Dodgers at uh, 3.42. And then there's 3.44, 3.53. So there's just a huge separation between the Giants and, and the next closest team by fielding independent pitching by their starting rotation. The Giants starters ERA is 3.59, which is, I mean, the Dodgers are at 2.71. So the Dodgers are overperforming their FIP by a wide margin and the Giants are underperforming it by a wide margin. And so the defense certainly plays a role in that. It certainly did in the individual case of Alex Cobb, and that gets applied to this entire rotation and to this number, the ERA and the FIP. So anyway, they're first in ground ball percentage, first in fielding independent pitching. They keep the ball on the ground. That's the thing, too. Cobb and Webb have among the highest ground ball rates in Major League Baseball. They have among the lowest average launch angle against them in Major League Baseball. And Alex Wood is a ground ball guy as well who keeps the ball in the ballpark. So that's a big deal. Unfortunately, it hasn't really translated to the bullpen, which led the majors in ERA last season. So if only they could put those two together and play better defense like they did last year, but it just hasn't been the case. So anyway, coming up in just a minute, I want to get more into the continued breakout of Joey Bart, something we've been talking about almost every day. And he did it again yesterday. So we're going to look into the numbers pre and post being sent down in just a minute. But first, betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. 
Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting, scores, and podcasts they have you covered. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. All right, as promised, I want to talk about Joey Bart and just a couple of other facts from this game last night. Joey Bart, just to get it right out there, he had three hits. And his one out was a strikeout. I was kind of beaming about his strikeout rate post being called back up in early July. And even with the one strikeout last night, it was four plate appearances, meaning a 25% rate of striking out last night. And since getting called back up, let's just get right to it. The the man has a 144 weighted runs created plus, hitting 314 with a 344 on base percentage and 523 slugging. As we talked about yesterday, I mean, it's gone up. He had three balls in play yesterday, and they were all hits. He did hit a, what, 112-mile-an-hour rocket to left field. ended up being a single because he hit it so hard it was played off the wall, and he was unable to get to second base. But he also almost hit a ball out to right field. It was a high drive to right. It actually wasn't hit all that well. It's just Oracle Park's dimensions specifically kept that ball from being caught, I would say. In most parks, that's probably caught, just to be honest. But here, it's tough with the wind and all that. And it was very close. It somehow hit the top of the high wall in right, but didn't hit the tin. So it kind of is hard to do that. But he did it. And that was a hit. And then he had a bunt hit, just a perfectly placed bunt hit up the third base line against Madison Bumgarner. So the average on balls in play is what I'm trying to get to is 415 since being called up. And so that number is not going to last. So these numbers are not going to last, but the numbers are so good. They don't need to last for him to still be productive. What really stands out to me is that he's only struck out 31.1% of the time since he has been called back up. So a 144 weighted runs created plus 31% strikeout rate. Walk rate is just 4.4%. But still, it is an impressive turnaround for a guy who, uh, when he was sent down, had a strikeout rate of 45.4% and a weighted runs created plus of 79. And just a couple of people have asked me what weighted runs created plus is. It's an all-encompassing offensive metric that's park adjusted and average is 100. So if you're at 110, you're 10% above average by this number, which is an all-encompassing offensive metric that is applying the proper weights to all the different offensive outcomes. And like I said, it's park adjusted. So if you have a certain average on base and slugging in Denver, and you have that same average on base and slugging as a Giants player, the player to do it for the Giants has been better because they play in a worse, significantly worse offensive environment. So if you do that in San Francisco, you might be above average. And if you do it in Denver, you might be below average. So it's doing that uh, calculation for us. And so Joey Bart, he's been quite good. And the confidence has just been there. And he's he's just looks relaxed. And Gabe Kapler's talking about him. And yeah, it's just great to see. I just also want to mention a few other things from this game. Evan Longoria hit a home run against Madison Bumgarner. And then the bullpen kind of got into some trouble, but also got out of it. Alex Young who we haven't really talked about much, has been pretty solid. And he inherited a bases-loaded situation that had been set up by Tyler Rogers, who just continues to not be the same guy. But Alex Young comes in, faces one hitter, and strikes him out. And he's a former Arizona Diamondback. And so that was a big spot. One swing of the bat, it could have been 6-5, to but he shut the door, got that strikeout. So they've introduced some new bullpen arms recently with Alex Young and Thomas Zapucky among them. And so it's kind of a big thing to watch is how do these guys perform over the last month and a half of the season and can they can they become uh, future pieces for the Giants? That's kind of what they're doing here is auditioning these new relievers. So anyway, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen today. Now make your second listen the Locked on MLB podcast. MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan brings humor, passion, and unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories around the league. Follow the number one daily league-wide podcast Locked on MLB on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K.
If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a ton. So thank you in advance and thank you to everyone who's done so already. Huge game tonight. It's going to be, I, I don't want to call it a mismatch, but Jacob Junis, Giants fifth starter against Merrill Kelly, arguably the D-backs best starter. Can the Giants finally crack this code that is Merrill Kelly? It'll be, if they can do it, it's huge. And then you root against uh, the Phillies and the, and the Padres as well. So we'll be back breaking that one down tomorrow. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.